music music works is an initiative that we had done long time ago six years ago and we keep doing it every once in a while the whole idea is that it explores the vocational vocation and they always workshop seminars and all that stuff and understanding how the working musician can can function and can work in this ever uh, changing environment so that is that that's what music works is in case you guys are wondering what that logo is um and i think we do maybe uh, every quarter we do a couple of uh events uh online and offline before based on that okay super welcome everybody welcome uh, so good to have you guys here thank you all for joining um we've got uh, this is the second in a series of webinars that we've done uh that we're trying to put forward we're trying to get a uh, closer to a clearer understanding of where we are and what's going to happen and what's happening in this ever evolving landscape that we are find ourselves in uh today we are talking about the adaptive performer so last time we did a series on production music production composition and in this new day and age what happens what can we do today we're talking about performance and we are incredibly lucky and incredibly honored to have the guests that we have right now with us who are live with us right now uh i'm going to be introducing them in about uh, a minute or so so we're going to talk about uh, uh, adapting to the changing environment uh, what are the new type of gigs uh, free gigs versus paid gigs there's a lot of that stuff going on artists and brand associations you know that kind of thing maybe uh, what are the skills that are required in this now in this now time uh learning music online what is the viability of it and all that stuff so we need to get a clear understanding of that uh the format everyone is going to be we're going to chat for about 40 minutes after which we will do a 20 minute q and a uh please put all your questions in the q and a section uh that on your on your zoom um and maybe you can mention the name of the panelist that you want to ask the question to with your question I do recommend that you wait for a while uh, until you ask for all your questions because a lot of them see, will get answered as we chat you know as we go through but feel free to put all your questions guys uh, and uh, we will try to get to them as much as we can in the in the in the Q&A section all right super so first let me start off by introducing some our fantastic guests we have Michael League Michael's thank you so much for joining us Michael is a Grammy award winner and the band leader of of course mm -hmm. Starkey Puppy and his new band and Bocante uh, he's performed and recorded with some of the best musicians in the world obviously from Michael McDonald to Esperanza Spalding to Joe Walsh who by the way came to came to TSM the other day and we did a workshop with him it was really cool and Wayne Grant Joshua Redwin performed at Blue Frog so very I uh, love the people that you've associated and worked with you uh, Michael has been a strong supporter of music education and we've had the privilege of you doing a live workshop at TSM I think that was the last time you came back and uh, we've been friends ever since thank you Michael thank you very much for joining us really appreciate you being here thank you I'm very happy to be here thanks for having me <laughs> thank you brother uh next we have Sean everybody knows Sean Sean is uh well Uh, he called what the golden voice of india you pretty much sung in every language possible in every medium possible i mean this guy is so versatile and he's in depth in his in his career you know it's extensive your experience on stage and on in the studio is unbelievable on top of that you've hosted all these shows uh you're a household name because of all these shows that you're hosting also and you're not just the singer but you know you I I admire the fact that you're a mentor and a guide to a lot of musicians. I know I know that you do that with our TSM students too. So I I, uh, I love you for that. Um thank you Ashu pleasure much. to be here with you and of course we go back such such a long way almost really 20 now. 20 we'll years be, now so we've been recording together for the longest time sure, and guys right, right. I I have to tell you man I I would say Sean is if one thing I have to call him is like He's probably the nicest guy in the industry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. You're a really you're a good Doesn't guy. Doesn't pay to be nice, but you know you're just stuck with that <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. But I guess I, in the long I, term I, it does, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. Really really appreciate it. I have fun talking with you. Sure. Um next we have Jason Camilio. Jason. Now Jason is an 
very interesting guy. He is, uh, he's a composer, he's an arranger, he's a songwriter, he's a trombonist, a guitarist, a producer, and he's a developer of global education programs and partnerships. You know, as his role as the assistant vice president of global initiatives at Berkeley, he develops opportunities for skilled, talented, and motivated performing artists to reach their career goals. And that's going to be very insightful for us to understand from his experience. And uh, he basically engages with all kinds of artists and festivals and institutes from all over the world. And Jason, it's a real honor and privilege to have you here. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. This is fantastic to be with everybody. Thank Thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, last but not least is our friend Ankur Tiwari. Ankur. How can I say about him? He's an indie artist, a singer songwriter, composer, performer, music supervisor, and a poet. Uh, you all will know his, he was instrumental, I think, in uh, you know, making Gully Boy the big success that he is, that it was, because all the music that he kind of shaped and put into there. He's also a man after my own heart with his uh, passionate activism, and he uses, which he uses his music. For and is a strong proponent, according to me, of all things that are good in this world. Uncle, you're a good man, and we're very happy to have you here. He's also a teacher. Uh, he's doing a course on lyric writing with us, and we're not only friends, but we also recently collaborated on some projects together, composing music. So it's so much fun to have you here, Uncle. Thank you thank, so much. Thank you so much, and I'm honored to be in such amazing company today. Yeah, with no, it's, it's super, all of it's you. Super. It's amazing. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And uh, just in case, uh, I, mean, I guess. By the way, I should introduce myself. My name is Ashu. I am a composer, producer. I've been producing music for the last 25 years or so, doing lots of TV commercials and ads and, and soundtracks. Uh, I've also performed a bit uh, from festivals like Sula Festival to South by Southwest. I was also the co-founder of a couple of venues, the Blue Frog, uh, the Quarter, who programmed the Royal Opera House for a while. And uh, I'm the co-founder of the True School of Music along with my co-founder, Mr. Nitin Chandy, and I also teach at True School. I teach the music composition. So that's, that's our panel. So I'm very happy and privileged to have you guys here. So let me, we're going to start off. So guys, the format is we're going to talk to each of these guys for seven minutes or so, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Um, let's explore. Let me start with Michael. Can I start with you? Uh, you know, you know, you, you started Stocky Puppy when you were in freshman year in college, right? And I would like really keen to know, first of all, that environment, that music learning environment that you were in, how, like, how, did, how important was that for shaping who you are today? You know, just the, the, the learning aspect of it. First, if we can just start off with that and then we can just chat a little bit further on what you guys are doing now. Sure, yeah. Um, when I arrived at the University of North Texas, you know, at 18 years old, um, I was probably the least developed bass player in, at the school. Um, I, I, I was a guitar player. I started playing guitar when I was like 14. And then my senior year of high school, which is like 17 years old, I switched to bass because there were no bass players in the high school <laughs> jazz band. You know, there were three guitar players. And so, of course, you give you make the worst guitar player play bass, right? That's how it works. That's how all bass players start. Um, so, uh, so, I, so they just handed me a bass, an electric bass. And so I played bass my senior year in the, the school jazz band, you know? Um, and I liked it so much that I decided to go to university for it. But, you know, I, I went to a very conservative uh, jazz focused University, North Texas is, is not, doesn't have the same reputation as like Berkeley, you know, which mm -hmm. Berkeley is about modern music. North Texas is really about like jazz, you know, yeah. and, and in this kind of like pinnacle of jazz is 1969 kind of, kind right. of way, um, which is its own conversation. Um, but for me, this place was actually perfect um, because I was arriving not having played double bass, you know, at all really. And, um, and coming from a small town, so it wasn't very competitive. So when I showed up at university, I just got my butt kicked. I mean, from the, really from the second that I arrived, my, you know, I started my audition for like band placement, you know, they rank these bands. There's like, you know, 16 bands or something and they rank them. And I got about 20 seconds into my audition and the professor stopped the cassette 
cassette tape, um, <laughs> stopped the cassette and was like, uh, how long have you been playing double bass? And I said, I have like, I don't know, three weeks, you know? And, 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 and he said, all right, you're really behind, you know? And, and I'm going to give you one year to prove that you have the capacity to, to rise to the median level of the players around you. And if I don't see like really dramatic progress, I'm going to advise that you change your major from music to accounting or something. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, so, uh, but I mean, he did it in a very loving way, actually. It wasn't, you know, it it was harsh, but it was, it was deserved, you know? So basically from that moment, I was like, okay, yeah. I mean, there, there were kids at that school that had been playing bass for 10 years already. And I had been playing for three weeks, you know, a very physical instrument, you know, double bass, acoustic bass. So I just practiced, you know, 10 hours a day for four years, you know, and I wasn't alone in that. I mean, really the, the most of the students at the school, the ones that survived those four years were in, you know, either practicing or playing between 10 and 16 or 17 hours a day, you know, and, and, um, and that's why I always, whenever I, I speak at schools, I, 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 I make, I make a point to say, you know, if you're in university as a music student, you know, take advantage of those years because they're the only, it's the only period of your life in which your primary task, your primary responsibility is to wake up in the morning and, and suck less at music. You know what I mean? And like, like it's the only time in your life that that is really your, get your, your responsibility. Like a banker goes to work and tries not to screw up people's money you're in university, your job is to get better every day. And when you leave university, that practice time will not be there. Yeah. That, that, you know, hour and a half checking out music history or that two hours checking out 19th century counterpoint or whatever it is that you complain about when you're in university, you won't have that time. Um, and I would say that, you know, especially for me being like a band leader of a very grassroots band, I didn't practice for 10 years after college. Mm. I was just sending emails, making phone calls, trying to get a clinic at the True School of Music, you know, <laughs> trying to do whatever I can to survive and to provide for my band that I've only been able to start practicing over the last like three years. And it's my favorite thing in the world. Um, but I was able to survive as a musician during those 10 years because I built a very strong technical and theoretical foundation in my four years of university that I've leaned on in my moments of kind of like being overwhelmed with all the business stuff. I um, mean, that's been able to get me through it. So, you know, you know that's, that's really, that's really, it's really important you're saying this because I feel a lot of the times people want to get out quickly and they want to start their careers quicker and you know, that this moment. And, and sometimes I feel people are rushing to do that because they want to start earning quickly. They start and only later on, do you realize that, Oh man, that was golden time. That was just the most amazing time for me to harness or become who I'm supposed to be, you know? Yeah, well, I think we're in the age of Instagram. You know what I mean? It's like you post a video and you go to the bathroom and you come back and you have a load of comments and likes in instantly, you know? Yeah. And um, while this, I think, is, a, is, a, is a, an incredibly powerful tool, at the same time, I think it's created a culture, especially among youth, of like, notice me, Right. You know, like like establishing their brand really before before their foundation of exactly. musicianship and musicality. And what that does is it makes you, um, it makes it very easy for you to be a very temporary artist, right. a flash right. in the pan. You can make some cool Instagram videos for a year, and everybody knows your name. Yeah. But then when when the world moves on to the next trend if you don't have your fundamental musicianship together, if you don't have versatility, if you're not able to adapt, you know, speaking of the adaptive musician, then you're really setting up a very dangerous kind of straw house to live in for the rest of your life. And often when I'm giving a masterclass, you know, I'll spend 90 minutes or two hours talking about concept and philosophy and deep musical ideas. And then we'll transition to have the students play. And then I find like, wow, you know, these students, are at such a low level actually mm-hmm. that like maybe I should have spent that hour and a half really just ironing out, you yeah. know, fundamental elements of music, like having a command over rhythm, having the ability to hear something in your head and play it. 
Um, and uh, although I, I, I don't want to imply that it's ever too early to think about philosophy and concept. I believe that, that at any moment in your musical career, you should be listening to interviews by David Bowie and Miles Davis and, and musical philosophers and taking that stuff in. But I, I, what I'm saying is that now, more than 10 years ago, when I'm teaching, I notice that there are, there's more deficiency in just command over music yeah. general it, musicianship it is, and more of a focus on establishing it, yourself easy, as a I think social media and everything has made, made, made you become easierly attracted. You can get your fans really quickly. And you're right, the longev longevity is what's the main issue with, with not having a solid foundation. So, you know, now, see now, in like the, the guys who are in your, in your view, in your world of musicians that you hang out with and what's happening in now post-COVID or in this, in this era, how do you see that adaptability role coming into play and around you based on what people's previous experiences have been, you know, from education to whatever. Do you, do you, can you, can you give some insight on what you see around you right now? As, as far as what people are doing with their own, you know, are they going sure. back to study? Are they upskilling? Are they, what are they, what are they, what's, what's going on with the, with the boys around you and girls around you? Well, I mean, what do I, what I see is a lot of fear and uncertainty. You know, I mean, and that, and that, this is like top to bottom, you know, maybe there's a lot of people watching this that are music students and they think, oh, Snarky Puppy, they're famous, <laughs> which everyone in my band would laugh at, by the way, if they heard you say that. Um, but, you know, oh, they must be fine. And that's not true. It's not true. You know, like everyone is worried, everyone is concerned, and everyone is seeking um, solutions, you know, but I think because it's such an uncertain time, this really kind of triggers our creativity and we have to like put that into high gear to try to yeah. seek creative and, and timely uh, solutions. You know, I've seen a lot of people going into go, uh, doing more teaching. I mean, Snarky Bubby's always done a lot of teaching, but we started yeah. like a, we were doing like a seven night a week masterclass series with a different member of the band teaching a different right. masterclass on a different topic. We did that for months. And then we started inviting other artists in yeah. um, to join us. And that was really cool. Uh, and, and, and we're, you know, now we're trying to create a, a, a digital platform for exclusive content um, from, you know, whether it's literature, demos, unreleased videos, whatever, you know, that artists can, can kind of create some kind of income from this is a beast. It's a big project. And, and, and we're working on that with a partner. Um, so I see a lot of people doing that kind of thing. Um, but you were talking about Encore as like a, um, as an activist. And I think that the really interesting, I'm, I'm sorry, I know we've gone way over my five to seven minutes. No, but no, I, no. I, I think, I think the, 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 the interesting convergence of COVID shutting down the music industry, plus um, the, uh, the, situation in terms of, of racial inequality and tension in my country, which has spread out to, to, to many other countries, um, you know, has created a, a kind of perfect storm in a way um, that is um, reestablishing the artist's role as a voice for the unheard. Yeah. Yeah. And as, uh, and, 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 and our responsibility, I would say, to speak out against um, injustice, unequivocal injustice, not, you know, talking about advocating a political can for a political candidate, but really this is a thing that is just humanly wrong and we need to talk about it. And, 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 and I've noticed a lot of artists kind of being like, well, I'm not making any, any money anyway, so yeah. I might as well make a difference. And I think that actually it's almost a good thing in that way that, that COVID and the racial thing have, have corresponded because people have more free time. They've been more reflective, more emotionally vulnerable, and, and we're seeing artists kind of re, retaking that position in right. society as a voice um, uh, I'm against people. a lot of artists flourish in this, in this space because you know what? It's, a, there's a, it's, a, it's very real what they're singing about, what they're talking about is very real because this is the human impact of this whole thing is, is very real. So there is the art I'm almost feeling is becoming very real. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's almost as if this, I feel this has kind of become like this level playing ground for someone who's authentic can, mm -hmm. as can possibly shine through, you know, and maybe there's an opportunity for people to be able to express themselves in a, in a, in a true authentic way. And I think, there are, there's a lot of opportunity for that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So do you, you do a lot of, um, 
online stuff so do you you know what do you have to say to someone says like hey i can't learn. can you learn music online what can you cannot learn music online look this is a big debate that's happening right now as far as what to do cuz the schools are shut you know so what did you I mean about that? i will say um that uh by the way you have to see this this is my girlfriend's cat oh man he woke up but he was <laughs> he was like snoring audibly um i i i would say that uh that right now and i'm not saying this because you paid me because you didn't pay me that's the truth <laughs> yeah, that's the um that if i had to choose one place to be right now it would not be in the professional music market it would be in school because when you're in school you recognize i'm not making any money anyway right like yeah. school is an investment you put money in and you take in all this information that you can build your future career on um to me right now the econo or the the academic environment in the times of covid doesn't seem that different to me than the academic environment in times outside of covid i mean like as as a as a student experience yeah maybe you're not even in a classroom but the bottom line is like if you compare that experience to my experience hmm. 10 10 and a half months a year touring now to 0 months a year touring yeah. that's a very dramatic change that's true you know and so while of course the 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 landscape looks different academically right now it doesn't look that different compared to other positions um and and so i would say that if i could yeah if i could choose anywhere to be right now i would be a student unfortunately i was born 13 years too early for that um so i'm just trying to figure out how to how to pay my rent but um but and as far as the online thing goes look i mean this is a you know my foundation as a musician is largely in black american music right black like like yeah. jazz funk soul gospel rock and roll um hip all, all that you know all the 17 or whatever genres that black americans created um and and none of those genres were invented in a university or developed in a university really there's it's street music um so for me the best place to learn this is the street um and the internet is has provided a kind of second hand street that if you were a jazz a white jazz musician in 1986 and you wanted to learn jazz but you didn't have a like like a a thriving jazz community near you your only option was a jazz college where you'd be largely alongside other white clueless people who had never experienced that black music in its natural environment but now you can watch videos on youtube of this stuff you can listen to to real artists the real deal mingus interviews louis armstrong you know and you can take this kind of in and i would say that actually that's a more off i i would argue that that is a more authentic learning experience if we yeah. think of the most authentic learning experience as coming up in a culture like you know a a like a a, a gypsy in the south of spain learning flamenco mm. or you know whatever you know pick your you know a, a fado artist in lisboa pick your traditional yeah, yeah. music and and the way that that music is taught from person to person master to apprentice you know um cultural environment i would say that the internet is a much better educator or or multimedia is a much better educator in terms of of establishing that street relationship than it is to be in a university in 1990 i'll just i you know to be to be ultra clear about it um the best situation is to i would say would be to be in a university in which you and in a musical culture you know in which you have contact with the real yeah, deal you need the curation of that of what of the, all the so much content out there you need someone needs to help you curate that It was fantastic yeah. thanks so much thanks yeah, sorry i talked so long yeah. no 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 lovely it was great i'm sorry i'm just, i hope everyone's enjoying it because i'm just enjoying this conversation it was so good michael i started taking notes <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect man yeah thanks fabulous. beautiful thanks yeah. and the second hand street and the internet thing is like something i'm going to quote you on <laughs> it's all yours encore it's all oh, yours bro. so so bro you been you you been you been busy you been not busy you been in all kinds i mean i i uh you know you i hear bursts of you online then i then i then you quiet online then there different things it's it's really interesting how you have actually explored 
this this space and and i know that you're not doing it from a calculating point of view you know so i want to just get your take on where you are right now as far as your performances are concerned what kind of things you're doing stuff like you know a uh, lot of people musicians are doing free gigs and or should they be doing that should they not be doing that and we see so many people right now every night they're out right every night they're doing it now if you want to get paid for it other brands going to be expecting you to keep doing it for free or what you know what is what can you advise or what can you insight can you give to the young musicians right now who want to perform and do something in india and what do you uh, just give me your take on that for me like it's always we my answer for these sort of questions is always follow your gut and don't listen to anyone else just do what you want to do because there will be various people telling you to do various things right so in the beginning i started when the when the lockdown happened in india and we were not going out i started doing gigs just because i wanted to reach out uh, i was going on a tour uh, and two days before i was going on a tour i was going to to the us for two three gigs but it all got cancelled and i was really kind of uh, upset about it that i would no, i would not be able to see i had no clue that it's going to last this long hmm. and i started doing gigs because i felt really anxious and depressed in a way of what was happening and i wanted to reach out or wanted to do gigs so i said what the hell i'll just do the gigs online then i started seeing a lot of people are doing gigs online and it, and i had lost that interest for that while uh, you know me really well uh, i'll be very honest i don't plan too much in advance i just go with instinct what i'm feeling in my gut and at that moment i was feeling that i should be on the internet then i felt that i should not like now i want to keep my distance i don't want to play so i stopped playing then a lot of people asked me to play i said i'll play if you pay me so then i started doing paid gigs then uh, they said we'll pay you this much money i said i'm not paying playing for that much money so they thought that i'm more expensive so they offered me more money so i said okay i'll play then so it it's all been always been actually for me instinctive and uh for me whatever you want to do you should do if you feel like playing and if you feel like playing for an audience right now you should play if you feel like that you should be paid for it you should ask for it and there should be no shame in asking for money and there should be no shame in playing for free i feel it's up to you and if you sing honestly when you on the like internet is a stage and when you on stage your only duty is to be honest towards yourself and towards your own audience sometimes you get paid for it sometimes you don't get paid for it. most of my life i've not been paid for it but i don't care a fuck like i i play because i play and that's what uh, if you can make business of it great if you can't make business of it sing because you have to sing and i feel this go for it i think i think it's it's really interesting because we are getting to the core again i think we're keeping touching upon this topic of what it means to be human right now you know to be yourself to be people are so like analyzing who am i what makes what takes you know what you know we, we are we are, i feel in very interesting times it's going back to the roots of being an artist and that changed dramatically yeah. with the recording uh, music industry coming in because the the value of the art shifted from the artist to the product which was your recording or your uh, yeah. you know your lp or your cassette or your cd or now the recorded thing and now i feel it's time that the value of the artist is coming back to the artist is and it is very important for all of us as artists to take ourselves seriously to take our band our brands seriously and our band seriously uh, and uh, and consider that uh, what you're contributing through music is amazing but even when you're not contributing through your music you are you are you are portraying yourself everywhere you're being honest with your music and even when you're not playing music you're being honest and i feel it's very important and sometimes you get paid like i get paid sometimes for not singing not that i sing badly for not singing as in i would they would say that okay endorse our headphones or yeah. because because i've always been singing what i mean no because you I, represent something right you represent something and that representation is what the brand wants to pay you for and i so, feel it's very important because you should be paid not only as an artist who's playing songs but you should be paid for what you think and what you feel and sometimes as a song as well there was a i mean you could almost feel like apathy is kind of going down now right that which is a cool thing which is like people are actually 
feeling more and thinking more and uh, which is amazing stuff. which is like is really really, really, really yeah. hardcore yeah. people who i thought were like cold hearted <laughs> bastards have like suddenly like you know there's talking sense because you are it's like yeah. the whole world is going through a hijack yeah and like you know in the crisis your real side is coming out and those guys who i felt were really hard ass are actually soft sweet people and they're uh, kind of being very nice uh, in their own way you know that brings us brings us to a really interesting point of connectivity and collaborations because what's happening look at this panel right now and you guys we got all of you guys here i think the connectivity is becoming a very important thing right people are getting together they're collaborating they're doing all sorts of stuff so this is the time for content right this is the time for content creation this is the time for ideation this is what i'm hearing from all you guys i don't like the word content though but i'll go i like yeah, okay. art content art. feels like i'm making something in a factory <laughs> okay okay art i'm sorry art this is the time for art um yeah um super thanks man um shan yes, can yes. i can i pop can i chat with you for 2 minutes um are you there sorry shan has popped out shan has popped out shan you are i'll answer on behalf of shan <laughs> with a okay. beautiful smile that he has and i know okay so so then let's let's i'm sure he'll come back in uh let's go let's let's talk to jason jason welcome 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 thank you brother thank you for coming coming here now no really you uh, you represent a lot of what we at tsm also uh, are, are, are dream about and think about as far as your outreach programs your collaborations your partnerships that you do and and with your interest in i mean what is very close to us is upskilling in the professional space you know of people under of 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 getting their chops up a little bit more what is it now what in your in your point of view right now with all your vast experience around the globe right now for, as far as musicians uh, what do you, what do you think the they should be focusing on at this point in time you know as far as i'm talking about young musicians right now who who are worried about careers worried about the next gig from your point of view That's a great question. Yeah, it's what's really interesting is um I've seen I've been on the road for the last 20 years, you know, for Berkeley and for me the world is really small because I get to come and see all these amazing educators and artists and students in these different places around the world. What I've come to realize is that the younger musicians they're already doing this through social media. in the yeah. world is already smaller for them because there are students in peru who are huge k-pop fans and there are yeah. students yeah. in you know um in thailand who are huge you know west african afro pop fans and in the idea that um right now is there's no excuses for anybody whether you're an artist or a, a student the world has is open to you in a way that it never has been for for us as we were coming up learning um there's no there's no excuses to not learn to not take advantage of the information that's out there and uh i think it's really a matter of each student taking a look at what their strengths are what they do well and then looking at those things that they would they've always wanted to learn that they're missing and take the opportunity you know build a schedule come up with a routine that allows you to go in and whether it's joining a session like this and being able to have the opportunity to speak with these incredible artists and get their advice and their guidance or to do that self learning um it knows the time I, i i went to school and studied trombone and writing for big bands which was wonderful because this is something that's near and dear i love this music grew up on it but i knew very early on that i needed to build my skills so i was an early adopter to mm-hmm. online learning you know with berkeley online with um with whatever resources sources were out there anybody that was teaching online whether it's youtube or you know whatever that that was there i was getting access to it because if i'm sitting in a hotel room you know i could sit there and try and watch hours and hours of cnn or i can shed i can work on something um so that's one part the yeah. other part is that these environments allow you to actually connect with musicians from other parts of the world that's true and allows you to connect with the music 
the amazing music from India, the amazing music that's happening in, in uh, Latin America or in Europe, and, uh, and checking out all those things that you would like to do. I think the, the biggest advice I have is, you know, turn off the shuffle button and actually go deep. <laughs> like yeah. listen i've yeah. had more time now to yeah. actually listen to full length albums albums right yeah the way the so artist okay. wanted it side a side b both yeah take the time and, and go in and, and like read about the artist read about who influenced that artist and why they you know what their philosophy is how they came to what they're doing that that learning is as important as shedding your technical ability yeah. And then there's this other part, because as we're looking at the work that we're doing here today, the other thing that I've had to learn how to do is learn how to edit video, <laughs> learn how to shoot video. I bought a green screen. Yeah. You know, it's like doing all that work that, um, all the work that I would normally hire out to somebody else to do for me, I, you know, it's something that I need to have the skill to do that as well. So it's, it's knowing the music deeply. It's continuing to work on your skills, your instrumental musical skills, your vocal skills, and then learning the technology. Um, it's been so great to be able to actually be in this space and get uh -huh. my skills together with recording music and sending tracks to artists or sending projects out to artists and being able to edit and produce them here. So yeah. um, you can do it in the box. It's all in the machine now and all the lessons are available to you. And then with organizations, with schools, being able to work remotely and teach remotely, again, you just don't have any excuses to how, do it. How are they, how, how in your opinion are, are the schools adapting to this whole new situation, you know, and effectively not what uh, can they do more or, or is it, it's, it's, it is as viable, you know, how are they adjusting to this? What's interesting is um, a lot of artists and musicians have been getting better over the past few years teaching remotely yeah. because the world again it's just it's smaller artists are touring all over the world they're following the sun and following the festivals and meeting thousands upon thousands of fans and students and they want to stay connected with their audiences yeah. Yeah. and the best way to do that is through teaching so I think a lot of artists that are educators have had an easier time teaching through zoom or other mm -hmm. mediums um, preparing lessons and, and finding ways to pass information back and forth. You know, the younger musicians are already doing this really well. Yeah. And then what's really great is, you know, True School, a lot of other schools have started to create these online environments, yeah. you know, that are super great. Like I just signed up for a class to learn about the music of the Caribbean that a friend of mine is teaching. And it's been something I've wanted to do yeah. for years, and now I have the time to do it. And it's in Spanish. So I get to work on my Spanish jobs. That's great. And I get to see how they built this. This So it's the history of the music, the, the history of the dance, the history of yeah. how this all became, you know, very, very popular uh, music and salsa and how it can, you know, has evolved into contemporary um, Latin pop music. And this is like, you know, so there are, the, the adaptation has been going, uh, you know, it's, it's something where we, the way we talk about it a lot of times at Berkeley is like if if COVID-19 hadn't happened, the idea of doing this, working together like this or teaching online would be that thing that we would wait for. Exactly. Yeah, we'll get to that later. But yeah, it's, exactly. it's forced us to like move. I love it. That's what experience. I love about this. You know what? what like, you know, we're doing, uh, we're doing, Ankur is actually one of them who is doing it with us right now. I mean, we're doing this whole artist series of courses, right? And the whole idea was that the school will enable uh, the, uh, the, the academic part of an artist. So what makes that artist an artist? You know, what makes them themselves? And it's so much fun because I've been sitting and working with each of these artists and getting into their minds and then making courses out of their minds, you know, which is, which is great, which, which are things which, which I know people are interested in doing, you know, like why, why is he, he, why is she, she? Um, so this is a new opportunities and new ways of learning new things. I mean, that's what I find exciting. And I think, I, um, do you think uh, we have a long way to go or should people be uh, like, are we, so a lot of people might think we're still experimenting with education, <laughs> you know, when we are, no, I think we, 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 have to, we, all, we have to keep experimenting. Yeah. We have to keep doing this just in our the, nature as artists to be creative, to, to continually flip this and yeah. try and find new ways. Like we've been, you know, we're trying to play online, which a lot of artists are trying to do. And we know that the internet, the technology, 
technically doesn't allow for it. And we've tried all the products, <laughs> audio movers, Jam Kazam. Yeah, we're waiting for that to happen though. <laughs> but we're doing it with uh, Jam Taba and with Ninjam. And uh, we're working with the software developer who's an incredible Brazilian pianist. And we do jam sessions online. And it's, it's a little weird. It's a little <laughs> clunky. But we know that as, as we keep working on this, it's just like practicing it. It'll happen. It'll it. happen. Yeah. It'll happen. I'm pretty sure it's going to happen soon, sooner than we know it. You know, where we're going to be, suddenly it's just going to open up for everything and it's going it's to gonna become normalized in some time soon. Uh, yeah, so and the thing is that the risk is to not make it normal because yeah. artists never do. The artists, you just like keep leaning into it and keep going forward and challenging yourself as a teacher and as a student. Yeah. Sean, thanks, Jason. I'm going to go to Sean real quick. Sean, how are you, buddy? You're back. Good to have you back. We were just, <laughs> hi, we were, hi, hi. We were just talking about the artists and uh, teaching, and I believe you're doing an online course, right? You you have done one, or you you you. Uh, wanna... No, actually, I had put up like a masterclass sort of a thing, but that was ah. much before the, before the before COVID the, yeah. situation, of course. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, that was there, and uh, but besides that, of course, like you mentioned, you know, being there, uh, doing these reality shows, and judging a lot of the youngsters. So you, yeah. you know, you you learn while you teach, kind of a situation because. So it's interesting, but uh, I still don't think of myself as a teacher at all. Probably, I learned so much you know, today you, to everyone you, else. You've been you've been really good at I guess recognizing talent and understanding. You know, you 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 had a lot of experience within that that space, which is besides your own talent. But you talk about and you have your kids right now who are who are, <laughs> who are I don't know what they're going to be little uh, little Sean Junior singers or nah, yeah 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 they're going to chart their own uh, careers and their own <laughs> identity and. But in terms of recognizing talent, like, you know, the name of the yeah. uh, chat today is adaptive uh, performer. Yeah. So, you know, that too gets very, you know, it's so dynamic with changing styles, changing uh, societies, changing uh, sort of uh, even the audiences are becoming so different. So yeah. what I would think is, oh, this is the perfect timber. This is the perfect voice. And yes, you know, you're, you're there. You, it, it changes. There's a new trend. There's a new voice. And so... So more than actually identifying the talent, um, what we managed to do between me and my wife, who started this wonderful company called Happy Demic. So we yeah, created actually, a little space for, for that yeah. bit. That's so, you know, while you have a lot of portals which are actually, you know, allowing you to place your music, there are streaming sites, there is, you know, YouTube-like uh, spaces where you can put out your music. Uh, okay. When it comes to live music or when it comes to basically earning a livelihood, it's very difficult for a lot of these uh, talented musicians, young musicians, unless they go live, unless they start gigging, unless they start, you know, performing where people pay them. So that's what we try to create through Happy Demic, this company where, you know, and you know, when you think of that, then you generally want to play at bars or at restaurants. But you know, while that's a very cool culture in the West and many other countries in India, it doesn't kind of really work that well, you know, because, you know, they just pick up the guy who's the cheapest, doesn't matter how it comes through. And, uh, you know, sometimes you get paid, sometimes you get paid in beers, you get paid in coffees. So here you have an, you know, a professional setup that actually gets you corporate gigs. Uh, they curate the whole show for you so that, you know, you know exactly what is expected of you when you go there. So yeah. that's helped a lot of, uh, yeah. And it's like, a, and now what they've managed to do since coming quickly to, I know what the next question is, how do you, how do you get live into the COVID situation now? Yeah. So, so what they've gone is they've kind of gone now more. They always started, they wanted to start off as a tech company. So now um, I'm saying they, because I'm more the outside. Uh, when it, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, happy to be a part of this uh, thing. But the point is that now with, uh, you know, a lot of guys are doing e-performances, so to say, as in, you know, the online performances, which are personal. So they can actually so, so, go so, there and... So uh, like, uh, I will... I will hire you to get me a gig for my own private party, which is online, right? Perfect. It's like a music tech, uh, it's a music tech company. So, right. so online, whether it's, uh, you know, even if it's an individual, they so also like have something gig. like a, like yeah, a even for gig. one person, it's as cheap. You can just, you know, yeah. gift it to a friend on his or her birthday. So yeah. things like that. And besides that, of course, uh, you know, when you, uh, you know, over the years, so this whole thing was created. So there were a lot of these people who come in from these reality shows, perform really well and then you know they settle into a city they have to pay their bills and they you know and they're stuck with this popularity thing and they have no yeah. money to deal with it right. so uh, so this kind of gets them something to you know sustain themselves until they hit big time 
So, so are you seeing that happening right now? Are you seeing people actually booking a lot online right now? Because I, I, uh, you know, she hasn't asked that's me seen. for any money for a long time. So I'm sure her company is doing all right. <laughs> okay, good. And they're paying their, they're paying their rents and they're paying the salaries to all their employees. So, yeah. so, so I'm yeah. sure it's only when the artist makes the money will the company make the money because you know they have a minuscule percentage of what the artist and is what getting. About so, like, Brands and all, are they getting involved in this? I think or, or here, whatever? honestly, honestly, you know, we are trying to help the artists at a, at a point where, uh, you know, it's in a very, very nascent stage. Right. So once you get to that stage, you're going to have these managers who are going to swoop in and they're going to, you know, get their deal out of you. And that's yeah. when all these other things will happen. But this is at such a primal, such a primary stage that no one wants to manage you. If, if, if an artist is being paid 5,000 bucks, what's the manager going to do you right. know, with that artist? So right. we want to get them and a lot of them have moved from that level to a much, uh, to a higher level now. And, you know, they're, so I'm sure, and once they reach that point, we're happy to let them fly. We're happy okay. to, you know, we know there's no contract that holds them back. There's nothing that, you know, there's nothing exploitative about this. You know, over the years that I've been, uh, uh, been a part of this whole, you know, seeing these kids, uh, it's just something that we do for them. <laughs> yeah. So all you young musicians out there listening, please, Get in touch with Sean, get in touch with Happy Demo, try and get some gigs out of this. Sure, true. I mean, there's an, ex there's an entry point. There's an entry point which has to be completely just off amateur and an exit yeah. point when you're really, you know, ready to take on. So Super. that's how it works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. It's about 7.45. We're not bad. We're like into, we're just about five minutes late in our schedule. So thank you guys so much. Uh, let's, let's, uh, all mics should be off now and we can all just chat. So without any, okay. Okay. <laughs> so there's no, there's no agenda anymore. I think, I think we did get a really cool, some cool points across. I think the one thing that has resonated with me a lot is about uh, the, the, the context of what we are doing of, of art right now. I think it's getting deeper, more human, more meaningful. I think there's a lot to achieve there as a creative person right now, you know, so should stay there. It's just really, it's just really, really to stay there. I think this is a great time. I think people are set to learn. This is the time to, um, I wish I was back in school again. You're right. Yeah. Uh, Michael, True. you're right, man. That those three, four years that I want just to go and focus on my art and try and do that. It's a, you know, this is how, this has been the great leveler, right? Everyone. I mean, uh, you, uh, you said, a, uh, asked a question to Jason about advice to young musicians who are concerned about the next gig. So, just to make the young audience feel better that what's worse than a young musician trying to get the next gig is an older musician trying to get the next gig. <laughs> so, so you're young. So is it like true. time, time is on your side and you must yeah, you uh, the enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think the, the other thing about that too, is that these, the, the, the lines of, of age or station or all of that is gone. It's all it's gone. wiped off the map. It's gone. It's um, gone. I think, you know, younger musicians, have every opportunity to reach out to their, their favorite artists and say, hey, I have really? this. Would you be willing to do this? Yeah. The only thing that artists can do is not respond or say no. Yeah. The other thing they could do is they could say, yeah, let's talk. So, right. you know, don't just be waiting for the opportunity. Try to be the creator of the opportunity. Absolutely. And, and well. learning from the young, you know, like, the, like I was doing this, uh, the only reason I'm doing the lyric writing course because... I feel that you, at least for me, I learn when I teach. So yeah. and yeah, for true. me, it is the only reason I would ever teach is to learn. And I would take an example of learning from the young. The other day, I saw this picture on the internet of this girl who had made her studio in her cupboard. And wow. I was so excited. I reached out to her. It's Ditty, you know, the singer songwriter. I was so excited. I reached out to her and now we're writing a song together and I emptied my cupboard and my recording booth is in my cupboard wow. now. You <laughs> call, call the song coming out of the closet or something. <laughs> I, I thought I saw something in your cupboard that day when you were, I thought I saw a mic in your yeah. cupboard. I was wondering what yeah, that I, was. I have just yeah. like shoved pillows in it and I have a microphone there and then. Uh, you would allow Mike to breathe. You kept it in the cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's superb, man. That's superb. Uh, okay, big, guys, big, uh, big takeaway also, uh, yeah. she was, was that, you know, especially for the youngsters, since the whole exercise is for the youngsters that, you know, you've got to take your work seriously, but a lot of youngsters end up taking themselves a little too seriously. That actually, uh, you know, doesn't help them grow as, as people, as musicians. So it's very important that, you know, 
you know, you know, I have the statement. I want to say this before you even know what you want to talk about. You, you, yeah. you, you know, you make these statements, which I think, like um, you know, we all agreed that so much of this pressure of becoming a star already through you yeah. know internet and stuff like that. So don't be in a rush and you know take your work seriously and put in a lot of hard work. And I'm sure that's going to make the big difference eventually. Or yeah, like that straw hat. Straw hat is going to break <laughs> if you yeah. kind of build it too fast. You know, I, you know, I keep telling, I keep telling that they've heard me say this a hundred times. The other kids in the school, it's like you can only make a first impression once, right? And once you, once you do that, a bad, like I've had a singer come in, and honestly, who didn't cut it, and in, in right, a session, right, right. in a session, I didn't call that singer for five years afterwards, you know, because I'm not going to take the chance again in the studio. Sure. So if you're not ready, don't push it, don't uh, just. But, sure. but then be yourself. But there's, a, there's a flip side to that, Ashu. I've seen a lot of people because that, you know, I'm going to only come out when I'm ready, only come out when I'm ready. Yeah, but yeah, without experience, yeah, yeah. If you don't yeah. have that experience, it's not going to help however good you get with theory. So you've got to figure that fine line. You come out, you'll fall, you'll get up again, but just keep getting better every day. That's more important. Yeah. Yeah, I think you got to put a bit of your 10,000 hours in somewhere. Or the other. Yeah, true, true, true. <laughs> like Michael well, guys, did. <laughs> Michael did. Yeah, yeah, you know, some, sometimes if you get it yeah, naturally, Sometimes when you get things naturally, it's actually a disadvantage. Yeah. You know, because I had this whole, you know, I have these three generations of singers. I always, as a kid, you grow up thinking, right. oh, you know what? I'm meant to sing. I have it all. I never worked too hard about you guys it. Were, you and guys were singing since you were what? Like six, seven? How old were you? Yeah, I, we cut, you know, I, I did the, my first... The, uh, the studio and all, you uh, and yeah, four, four years, four years. Four years. Four, four, I was in front of a mic. <laughs> yeah. So... So it came to me as naturally as anything. So I never put in that many, you know, man hours in, in working hard. Yeah. Now I sit and do my riyas every morning because I'm feeling like, you know, with age, you're going to lose that voice. Yeah. So keep it yeah. young. So now I'm pushing it. But yeah, yeah. when they're young, they got to make the best of their time because uh, it's not going to come back. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Let's, let's and, answer some questions. So we have any questions? Uh, Did you want to put up? Some, uh, let's choose some questions from here. We've got lots of questions. Uh... Okay, for the panel from Vikram Khanna, do you think there's an upper age limit for studying music and making a career out of it? Do you think there's an upper age limit? I think there's limit? a one word answer for that. Everyone, everyone can answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel, that, I, I honestly feel there is a upper age if you're already practicing it from a young, you, you can't just wake up one day and say that, you know what? I can make it. So what if I'm 60 or so what if I'm 40? So, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of, yeah. So operate just. No, well, like, here's, well, a, here's, here's, here's a, I have a question for that question. What is yeah. making it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. What is making it? What is success? That's a good question. That's a good question. You know, I, I think that that's a, that's a really subjective thing. And, um, I, you know, it's, you know and it's, yeah. it's perilous for yeah. people that are just trying to express themselves. So yeah. I think if you want to create, go and create. Yeah, and learning to create, learning for that. You know, we had, I remember when we first started TSM, the first, I think the first year or the second year, we had our oldest pro student. And this guy was 68, right? And he had just graduated, I mean, he had just retired and all, and he joined our pro school to do it. It was fabulous, you know? And he was, his name was Mudli. Mudli, if you're out there, big hello to you, love you. Uh, and he used to, you know, drive up in his fancy car, but come in, but diligently be a student from morning to night. And, and, and he did it with us for a while. It was, so I don't think there's any age limit to learn, obviously, because you can be happy expressing it yourself. Uh, how do you, this one's from Michael and Ankur, how do you sustain motivation as a creator? I've seen before everyone, actually, but how do you sustain motivation as a creator? Michael, how, how do you do that? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 do you get when you when you first even uh, asked me about this panel and you said, you know, like that, that there's this idea that people are feeling like um, and, and, and I experienced this also when I spoke at Berkeley Valencia that that there there's like there's this idea in some people that like, oh, well, if I can't go to school, if I can't be in the halls of the school, um, I can't progress or something, or I, I mean, it's, I can't even explain it because it's such a foreign concept to me because every morning I wake up in the morning and I think about how much I suck <laughs> and like how much more work I need to do. Like, like the idea that I, I'm helpless and that I can't put anything new into my bag 
today yeah. because of some external factor is like yeah. a completely foreign right. concept to me, you know? Um, and yeah. if, the, if the more direct question is, what am I doing now? You know, I mean, during the during the the uh, the quarantine, I only had uh, uh, two instruments with me because I was I wasn't at my place. I was with my girlfriend, um, and uh, I just had a gimbri, which is like a Moroccan bass. It's like the okay. ancient ancestor of yeah. the of the bass, you know, mm. and uh, and a hand drum from Egypt, like a, a really? like a you ceramic. Did have, you did have your bass? No, uh... no, 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 no. I just okay. had these two instruments because I got them. In, you know, well, well, whatever. So I yeah. had them at the house. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, you know, yeah. practiced four hours a day for the first time in my life since I was in college, you know? Right. And I'm never going to play gimbri professionally. Yeah. You know, this is an instrument, it's a sacred instrument. It's like people spend their whole life, I mean, it's too deep of a thing to go into right now, but it's like, it's not a thing you pick up and then you're playing it on a gig, you know, the next day, it's a, it's, its right. own thing. But for me, just I love Ganawa music from Morocco. I'm working a lot with Ganawa artists these days. I, want, I really wanted to get into it. So I set up a routine for myself, you know, and I made sure that the practicing on these two instruments was like, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd have breakfast, I'd do 30 minutes of Duolingo, and then I'd do four hours of practicing because I know that that stuff requires very little mental energy. You know, right. doing, a, doing yeah. a, a, a language learning app, practicing, you know, and then later in the day, I would compose because I basically spent the whole quarantine writing up a, a, like a solo pop album that I've wanted to make for a long time. And I never, like Jason said, I pushed it. It was the, always like the last thing on my, actually the document on my computer is called ML Solo Album 2015. That tells you <laughs> what, a, what a professional procrastinator I am. Yeah, and I didn't, yeah. I didn't change the document title to remind myself yeah. of, you know, what a failure I am to get it done. And, and, but what I would do is I'd do all the practicing and the language stuff in the morning. And then in the evening, I would do composition. I would do lyric writing. I would do all the creative stuff because once you kick that stuff into gear, there's no going back to the playing scales with the metronome. Yeah. You're already yeah, yeah, in yeah, the, yeah. Okay. in the, in the, in the magical yeah. space of music, yeah. Yeah. you know? Um, and so I, so I would encourage people, you know, to more directly answer your question. Sorry yeah. again to really set up routines for yourself and, you know, yeah. with under the mantra of no, you know, know thyself, know your tendencies, know how distracted you get, know what stimulates you more and create a logical routine, you know, for yourself that allows you to work and build on the things, your, your deficiencies, but, and also kind of grow your strengths. Um, and, and you have so many resources. You have YouTube, you have online learning, you have, I mean, right now, there's never been a more fertile time That's true. in terms of resources. Um, so I would encourage everybody to do that, um, you know, um, with the objective of, of, of becoming the musician, the artist that you want to be, and not just thinking about making yeah. a career, because that's quite frankly, just like, doesn't belong in music. That's true. To me. <laughs> All right. Nice, nice. Great, I'm guys. Good. I'm uh, going gonna, gonna to have to... I'm going to have to... Wait, wait. The chat, chat, I got a question for you. There's a question for uh, you. We okay, answer that okay. before you go. Uh, uh, music in India is more towards Bollywood music in order to gain... Motor Bollywood music in order to gain respect and recognition as an artist. What is the other direction to go... To go to reach out and gain recognition and respect as an artist in India? Okay, sorry. No, uh, Besides no. Bollywood, what else? Uh, true, I mean, of course, uh, this is a very transitionary time where I don't think Bollywood and Ankur is here and a lot of us are here. And if you actually look at the last five years in Bollywood, most of the new uh, big acts or big names have all come from original music who've been, you know, kind of uh, siphoned into Bollywood. I think besides maybe Arijit, most of them had had their presence on the, you know, on YouTube or on streaming sites with really popular songs. So I think that's the way to go now. And uh, so I think uh, it's a good time to get that Bollywood, uh, uh, you know, sort of burden off our backs and just start creating music, creating, uh, you know, because even the films today, they use songs that are more like OSC songs. They don't have that singing and dancing yeah. around trees anymore. So a lot of the music is changing. A lot of the younger directors, producers, they're looking at songs from outside and just, you know, outsourcing them into their films. 
so i don't think one should uh, worry too much about getting respectability from bollywood anyway because most of the guys who are making it in bollywood are also coming in from outside so it's just a mindset that needs to change now and actually with all the ott platforms all the new stuff content that's coming out the whole focus in direction then ankur you can just touch upon that a little bit if you sure. want like you're a music supervisor who's supplying a lot of artists and musicians to all these all these uh, platforms right yeah so what are they looking for You know? I mean, for me, it's uh, kind of a blessing in disguise uh, because uh, of the way that the music had been structured in India. A lot of the old Bollywood songs are owned by labels who move very slowly, and they ask for a lot of money. So <laughs> that music doesn't work out. So the one way that I can quickly make music available for the people is tap into the independent world, which is what I have been doing for past two years, and there are. so many young musicians who have not even released those songs and they have been placed in shows in movies in uh, when we did the gully boy album for instance it's got 18 songs when the, when we started uh, working on the script when zoya the director was working on the script with reema and there were only three songs in the script but by the time with the whole album got created and the thing got created there were 18 songs and all those 18 songs came from unknown musicians who had never released a song before so so it is uh, it is a very good Perfect time example. and just to add to what ankur yeah. said that uh, ankur correct me if i'm wrong didn't you win like one of the major awards uh, a bollywood award for yeah so we won and that is so, for where we so won uh, we received the awards yeah. this year yeah. with uh, artists who were all independent who were yeah. pretty independent in the sense that they had not even released any music before true true so that very much answers the question but that's so that's great news i mean that's just fantastic news i mean the the bollywood engine is now being opened up by independent musicians that's and i always it. feel that you know these labels are uh, whether it's bollywood indie uh, non indie jazz rock whatever it's all the marketers shopkeepers job you should just make music and let them classify it and put it wherever they want to put it so it, Uh, you should just make music lovely lovely superb shar i know you got to go thank you brother <laughs> thank you it was so lovely much. guys really enjoyed the chat guys. learned a lot Bye, thank you guys thanks Bye. so much for joining i think thank you i think it's we reached 8 we're not bad 802 so we are very good with our time we been very disciplined and i want to thank you guys all so much for uh, for coming on board and doing this with us it was beautiful i think we did answer a lot of questions and uh, we'll have all this recording for us to look at later on and we'll be on our facebook page uh, do we have time for one more question nilesh uh, okay just one more sorry yes okay uh, sorry are you guys okay with that we'll just do one last yeah there's question. a lot of great questions too yeah yeah have you uh, seen the questions you have to put the q and a thing on oh. that's what i'm looking <laughs> uh, since a lot of musicians are using this time to do more teaching some some for the first time is there also a need for musicians to learn how to be effective educators yes that's a good question yeah uh, so for jason and michael you guys have any thoughts on that for, for to learn to teach it's really interesting uh, you know i i think uh, all of us what one of the best lessons i ever got was from my teacher hal crook who's an incredible trombonist and and it's the idea that he didn't teach me things about music but he taught me how to critique myself and self teach so it's a really really funny concept but the earlier in your experience that you learn to self teach the better um there's a professor who that I studied with early on Jack Peterson an incredible guitarist from North Texas by the way um he would record he would he, we we had cassette decks and we recorded all of our practice and he called it the truth machine the truth machine never lies whether you're playing in time out of time in tune out of tune musically not musically record at least part of your practice even the most basic thing if you're even playing scales um with a metronome or playing an etude or playing a transcription just record even 3 to 5 minutes of yourself on your phone and listen back and be critical like check out what you're doing and like write down oh wow i got to go back and 
you know, my phrasing is not happening or, you know, my range is not happening today or my articulation is not happening, you know, whatever that is. And then problem solve it, break it down to like the, the, on the molecular level of what's happening musically and begin to fix it. So that self-teaching is, is great because when you do that, when you start working with your friends or another musician, um, you might be able to actually be able to give them some constructive feedback. And that's where that teaching cycle begins, where you're like, hey, you know, what you're doing is this. Have you tried this? And it's not telling them what to do, but it's just sort of making those suggestions. And that suggestion is the opportunity to open one, just like a personal connection with a fellow musician. But also it's just like a great way to sort of say, hey, I, I experienced what you did. I recognize that. Right. And here's a way to, you know, work on it. Right. Yeah. Encore, did, it yeah. seemed like you wanted to say something at the beginning no, of that. No, he, he, he Nailed it. said something so beautifully that I don't want to <laughs> make myself look like an idiot now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but the thing is about, see, you're always learning. And I feel that teaching is, I don't call it teaching. I call it sharing. And, and it's a time that everyone has to be with each other, you know, like as a musician, as an artist, you're always learning from life. Like one of the biggest things that I talk about in my lyric writing thing is that if you have to learn how to write lyrics and if you learn how to write songs, then the basics should be there anywhere about your practice and you're knowing the instrument and the craft. But if you're not reading books, if you're not talking to people and if you're not traveling, then you're not going to be able to write. So live life and be curious. And as long as you're curious, uh, you'll be fine. I think, yeah, I think one of the most important things I feel from a teacher is unfiltered knowledge. That means just the fact that you can, they can, they can give everything that they have to you. You know, everything, there's nothing that they're hiding or keeping back because there's never going to be, they don't, when people are not insecure about imparting all their complete knowledge, you just learn so much. That's when you also learn a lot too. Um, I, I, I just love teaching because of that. I love just exploring what I know and what I don't know, you know, and I learn a lot more. You know, the angle in teaching, which I'm very curious about because I don't subscribe to it is the Indian thing of Guru Shishya, which is there in the Eastern philosophy of like when they would teach you Kung Fu, where the master would know everything. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I don't understand it. Although I'm curious about it. Like yeah. I've had like, for instance, my master's in acupuncture. Uh, but when it comes to music, I always feel it's about sharing and you're always sharing with each other. Like I, even as a teacher, you are sharing and as a student, you are sharing ideas and you both growing like this guy has already has a head start, but you're all growing together. Yeah. 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 But how, how do you think uh, there's one more question here? How do you envision the live performance landscape as we open up? especially in India with indie musicians already struggling to earn. How do you see the pandemic affecting musicians who are socio-economically disadvantaged? You know, all the live guys who are, there's so many live musicians who are not getting a job right now. All The, um, the times are tough and there's no good news in India uh, for very long. We've got a crazy government who's just like, I wouldn't say fucking it up, but <laughs> it is fucking it up for us. But uh, uh, but uh, the point is that as this thing, uh, the panel is about adapting. Uh, I'll take an example of uh, my favorite cricketer. Sorry, Jason and Michael. Uh, Sachin Tendulkar. Uh, he's the greatest batsman ever. And the amazing thing about his career, which I love, is that there were at least four times in his career that he adapted and changed his style of batting. And right, to, he started playing when he was 16. And then by the time he was 20, he got this tennis elbow. So he changed his batting stance. Then he, then he had a back problem. Then he changed his stance again. Then he, so he adapted each and every time. And you, as a musician, you have to hustle and you have to survive. And there's no other way. You have to find a way. And no one can tell you what that way is, but you will find it. Like it is when you know that you have to, I remember the days when I had no money and I would enter a room and I would say, I want that deal. I would make sure that I get that deal because if I don't get that deal, I won't have my rent yeah. to be paid. So, so you, you have to, uh, you have to work hard and you will find a way. Yeah. This, I mean, you need to, yeah, sure. Michael. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, yeah, we're talking about adaptation and just to, just to add something to on Cooper's statement there, which I think is very important. Um, the only thing you have to do to make a living 
making music is figure out how to get people to give you money for doing the thing that you love. That's it. You don't need a manager. You don't need a booking agent. You don't need a record label. You don't need a marketing team. You don't need a $3,000 a month publicist. You just need to figure out how to get people to put money in your hand for doing the thing that you love. And I think that, um, you know, we delude ourselves thinking that we need to have this gigantic yeah. typical yeah. infrastructure in place in order to survive. And yet we have examples of artists all around us that haven't done that thing. And we say, yeah, but that's because they're just special. No, you know, a lot of them are worse than you. They just figured out how to get people to do that thing. And, and, and I think that if you think about musical survival in this way, it takes the pressure off of you to make business motivated decisions. Yeah. It, it sounds paradoxical because it sounds like actually, well, if you're trying to figure out how to get people to give you money, then you're making a decision based on business. But actually you're not, I think, because I think it's the most direct route. I think what you, what, what the, 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 the process is, this is what I love and this is who I am as an artist. This is what I want to, I believe in and, and what I want to spend my time doing. That is concrete. That is done. I've already created that. Now, how do I bring people to that? Yeah. Not how do I manipulate and stretch yeah. out this Play-Doh so that people will buy the Play-Doh? No, no, no. The Play-Doh is not Play-Doh. It's a stone. You know, it's an adaptive stone that grows with you every day, but in a musical way, not in a business way. And then you figure out who is predisposed to liking this thing, this stone, <laughs> you know what I mean? That, and, and, and how do I get them to give me money? And then what happens is what, is what happened to Snarky Puppy, which is record labels come after you because yeah. you're a, 11 years in, that's, that's important to mention. Uh, 11 year, after 11 years of losing money, a record label comes to you and says, hey, we'd really like to work with you because you're a safe bet because you've already right. proven that right. you make money without them and they want a piece of your stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that this is absolutely the oh. best way to go about art. And it wasn't, you didn't have this in the 70s. It wasn't possible in the 70s. This is the new music industry that we live in now. And while yes, it's more polluted. Yes, YouTube is oversaturated all that stuff, you know, it's also simultaneously giving us opportunities to, to, to really put the art first. Um, because I have the ability to reach someone in Pune, you know what I mean? And I yeah. didn't without Universal 30 yeah. years ago, yeah. you know? So think about it in this kind of way. And the other thing, I know I'm really talking so much. The, the other thing that I, that I wanted to say is that what are we doing during the quarantine? What can we do? Use uh, like, oh, I don't have a U47 and a beautiful interface and a mixing desk and a $10,000 guitar. I'm doing a talk tomorrow night with Lewis Cole, who's one of the, the leaders of the band Knower. This yeah. guy makes some of the best sounding records you've ever heard in your life with a crappy clip on 1992 Micron computer laptop mic. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is a guy who really knows, and the concept of the, of the talk tomorrow is making recordings on a low budget. Any excuse you can throw at, at an artist like that for why you're not making great sounding stuff, that artist can shove it in your face. Yeah. They can say, I can do twice as much with half as much, you know? And so what I would recommend to all of the artists out there is use the resources that you have instead of using the ones that you don't as an excuse. You know, if you want to be a producer, but you never produced anything, call a friend who wants to be a producer, have them produce your song and you produce their song. Don't release it. Just, just go through that experience. What does it sound like with this acoustic guitar doubled versus straight down the center one time, you know, like all this kind of stuff. Like we have so many opportunities with, with, with very limited resources. And yeah. I would use the quarantine as, as, as an investment period in your art, as well as an incubation period for your creativity to try to grow these things so that when we emerge out into the world, the pre-COVID world, which hopefully will happen, which we also shouldn't th think of as a, like a fact that it, we may never go back. 
Yeah, that's true. There is no vaccine for AIDS. We don't know if there will be a vaccine for this. And we need to really think about, you know, and uh, that's not me. That's, you know, WHO experts saying, we, you know, we don't know. And, and, and I think that we have to bear that in mind and we have to think about, okay, because a lot of people would say, well, if we don't go back to 2019 land, I can't have a career yeah. as a professional musician. But if you go back to thinking about that thing as the direct line between your art and getting your audience to pay yeah. for it, I think that will always exist. So you won't be as discouraged from theaters on not being able to go above 20% capacity and blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, that's my like parting 96 well, cents. I was not too. But I think it's important to think about that stuff right now, to not be discouraged, but also to not be delusional, you know, think, and think about what we can do. I think so. I think one, 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 one fantastic theme that has come across this whole thing is actually truth. The truth and just be figuring out who you are and what you are and as an artist, as what you have to say. And that is what's actually the thing that's going to come back with the economic benefits, you know. And that's, that's really what it is. So, Beautiful. Thank you, Michael. I think it was really well said. Ashu, uh, I think you should answer that one question by Nathan, which says that will metal music survive in India? <laughs> yes, it will. it will. It will. If it survives in your heart, it will survive. Good answer. <laughs> and for those, uh, those, those students that are out there that are, you know, a lot of times uh, like we come across young musicians that are like, I have nobody to play with. I have nobody to connect with. And this is why you, you, you go to school. Part of the yeah. reason why you go to school, because there's a community there. There's a network there yeah. as well. That's, that is one of the huge benefits of studying, even online, um, to find those people that Michael's talking about to collaborate with. So, yeah. you know, register for a class. Register for a program. Um, if you have the ability to do so, you will meet the, your lifelong collaborators, and you'll yeah. begin to build your audience from that that group so now is the time to jump in that kind of that kind of answers my last question which i was going to ask all of you the very last one if someone wants and this is pertinent because if someone is thinking about whether to start learning music right now at this time should they do it or not you know because there's a lot of people think let me wait let me do it now but right now the last last question we're talking about learning music upskilling i mean with the pandemic you know that the one answer you, that you've got is that only truth is now. There might not be a tomorrow left. So might as well do it now because you don't know what is there 2021. Well, the Mayans would know. Yeah. Super. Well, guys, really, thank you so much. Uh, are we okay, Nilesh? Are we, I think we're... Yeah, before we go, Michael, you want to tell us about that talk tomorrow? Is it open for everyone? Oh, we, yeah. Maybe yeah, it is. Type it, type the address here Ooh, and then we can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I was, wasn't prepared for a plug. Uh, it came out naturally. <laughs> no, it's nice. Um, it's, it's called, uh, it's from this thing called Live from Our Living Rooms that, that my friend Siren Tip um, was host. She hosted this huge thing to raise money for out of work New York uh, jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. um, and it is uh, tomorrow night. Uh, it's at, um, my God, uh, okay, don't, I think, no pressure. It, we'll it's, it. it's, it's like, it's like 8 PM. I think it's like eight thirty or nine Spanish time. So that would be like, uh, like around 1130 or 12 sure. in India. And it's called live from our living rooms and really check out Noer, this band K N O W E R Genevieve Artadi and Lewis Cole. They're incredible, you know, and really the ultimate gorilla, like punk rock, nice. like mentality, um, electronic pop band. They do, they make like really clever musical electronic pop, but their whole attitude, like that, you know, two people in a car setting up all their crap, driving across the country for years. And they really like, they're, they're, they're uncompromising artists. Um, and I think that what he has to say um, will be, you know, priceless tomorrow if you want to, if you yeah. want to jump in. But uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate being here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Ashu. No, uh, guys, Uri, thank you, Michael. Thank Jason, you, Uncle. So thank, cool thank you. Yeah, man, it's great to connect. Thank, thank you, Ashu, for thank setting you, this up. It's great to meet everybody. You guys have really given a lot of insight and a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, we are trying to do these, these things at the school. We're doing a couple of things. Uh, so we started these artist series uh, programs, which Ankur is, Ankur, your, your course is almost sold out, by the way. So if anyone wants to do it, that's amazing. Quickly get on, quickly get on.
to it. The daily writing course that Amkur is doing. There are lots of other pro courses. Guys, study, continue studying. I give you. Uh, we we believe in that upskill, blah blah blah, all that. Uh, thank you guys so much, and it was beautiful. And we will see you guys soon. Yeah, Lovely. thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. See you guys. Bye bye.